get ready for more superstorms, more floods, more drought, more crop failure, more epidemics, more people on the move. Our focus this week is climate change. Scientists say its effects will become more intense and more frequent, especially in Africa. But is the continent prepared to cope with the consequences of a changing climate? Welcome to Our Voices. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and I'm here in studio with my co-hosts Orian Itangishaka, Hadiza Kiari, and Ayen Bio. When Cyclone Idai struck Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe in March, Africa's capacity to endure, respond to, and recover from major natural disasters was put to the test. VOA's Mariama Diallo takes a look. Cyclone Idai landed near the port city of Beira on March 14th, unleashing catastrophic flooding and killing more than 750 people. Survivors are still in shock. My family was busy screaming, Daddy, Daddy, where can I hide? Where can I hide? People need food, shelter, and health officials are worried about a cholera outbreak. Following the cyclone, uh, a lot of the infrastructure was damaged, uh, so people are, have limited access to, to clean water and sanitation, and the vaccine, this oral cholera vaccine, will help protect them from cholera. Thousands of miles away in the United States, members of the diaspora are worried about their loved ones. Zimbabwe native Freeman Chari, who lives in the state of Ohio, says one of his childhood friends lost five relatives. When I spoke to him, it was so heartbreaking. I, I, I tried to contemplate how it feels like, but I cannot. Imagine if I can break down and I'm all these miles away from home. What about those people who have picks and shovels who are trying to dig down into the ground to retrieve their loved ones? Chari and two friends started a GoFundMe page with the goal of raising $10,000. Within the first week, we had delivered about, um, I think, about 40 tons of, of food and clothing to the, to the area. The unfortunate part was the the area was impossible, uh, you know, the roads were washed away, and so we had to rely on about three to four helicopters to cover about 15,000 people. In New York, 21-year-old Yuna Hanan, a student at Marist College, says she's heartbroken about the storm's impact on her hometown of Beira. It took me three days to hear from a cousin that my parents were fine, but I only spoke to my parents. I only heard my parents' voice after six days. Together with two other friends, they decided to start their own fundraising page. We also have that privilege of like working on campus and get some money to send back home. But we thought of like all other families that don't have that privilege. They've raised more than $25,000. At first, they wanted to help with basic needs such as food and medicine, but now they are looking to provide farmers with seeds and farming equipment to help them get back on their feet. Maria Magiallo, VOA News, Washington. You know, it's going to take that part of the continent such a long time to really recover from what happened. The UN Economic Commission for Africa estimates that this cyclone has destroyed more than a billion dollars of infrastructure and resources in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Madagascar and Malawi. I mean, that, this was just devastating. And that port of Beira, which we see, which was struck, you know, that's a very strategic port in that part of the continent because all those landlocked countries there in Southeast Africa are dependent on that port, and that's their only access to the Indian Ocean. And experts are saying that port is gone. Wow. 500,000 hectares of crops mm. gone. And this is following a drought. Mm. So, I mean, this, the, the impact was just devastating. And the South African government, because parts of South Africa were affected too, and the South African government saying they were completely, completely shocked. They did not expect this cyclone to hit, and they were completely unprepared. Yeah. I mean, the billion dollar price tag is staggering, but I think the human cost is also uh, really staggering. I mean, if you think about it, the UNOCHA set up 100 
236 displacement sites. And these aren't traditional IDP camps, internally displacement uh, people site that we're used to. In South Sudan, we're used to IDP camps. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, they are used to IDP camps. Mozambique is not used to IDP camps. Um, and then you also think about the health risks that come after cholera. They're right. only, they have only vaccinated 400,000 people, and that's only half of their target. And those are the yeah. secondary yeah. disasters. And I mean, it's right. the knock-on effects of one disaster, which gives birth to yet another disaster and that's another. Right. And I think that, you know, no matter how much Mozambique would have prepared, when you look at the pictures of what Idai did, it's just, they just stood no chance. I mean, right. you know, it, it was just very devastating. Yeah. I think that what, I, what made me happy, though, was to see how African countries really came together to try to assist. From what we gather, Tanzania was the first country to actually send uh, both medicine and food to all three countries, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. And I was also happy also to see on a regional level, the SADAC, the Southern African Development Community, will also step forward and they give $500,000 to uh, these three countries. Um, also, we saw African Union also stepping up uh, from their emergency fund. They're allocating $350,000 there. And um, we saw also in the GoFundMe, as we've heard in the package, the GoFundMe efforts that are being done by the diaspora people. And it's just amazing. I think that this uh, disaster really showed how countries can come together and realize that this can happen to any of the countries. Right. And, and I must right. give the South African military props too. I mean, they are always, when Zimbabwe, um, you know, when things happen in Zimbabwe and, when the, and, and Mozambique and those surrounding countries, they're always at the ready and always helping and it really just shows that we do have this capacity to help right you know like yeah. in the um, West African region we experience different type of disaster ours is typically flood um, drought and um, forest fires mm -hmm. but um, what I what I'm gonna just focus on Nigeria and Ghana because we just experience mostly flood and for the most part, it's triggered by seasonal rainfall combined with poor drainage systems. And the way that the government deals with it is pretty much just coping mechanism, which mm -hmm. I think is wrong. That money that could, have, that could have gone towards future prevention should not even be used um, for continuous cycle of a recovery. Yeah. So I feel like that, that's something that the government needs to look into. And um, speaking about unpreparedness, you mentioned that it's interesting because um, there was an incident that came out of Nigeria where the federal minister was invited to commission um, several um, uh, fire trucks that were, you know, refurbished. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because you could see his reaction. He was mad. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the refurbishment is not just paint. The mm. refurbishment is supposed to be total. Cleanliness inside, functionality of the equipment. Because even if this vehicle had no paint whatsoever, as long as it is moving and you have life saving equipment here, that is refurbishment. You would attack because separately you would go there, there is no water. At any point in time, the water dispenser like this should always have water. That is one essence. It's not paint. I knew there was no water. And this is the reason oh. why <laughs> this is the reason I why mean, Nigerians too, have honestly. very low expectations I mean, no of these water, agencies. No hmm. water in a fire truck. That's, that's bad. Interesting. Okay. You know, this just <laughs> makes me think about the conversation around climate change. It's a serious topic. It's hard, hardly a dinner, converse, dinner table conversation. Yeah. But what are the conversations around climate change that we should be having that yeah. we're not? You know, the problem is not having the conversation. It is actually changing the mindset of people. People tend to, you know, pretty much um, attach any type of disaster with God or curses yeah, at, for the true. most part. So mm -hmm. that needs to change. And unfortunately, most of our meteorologists do, are not fully equipped to be able to predict um, accurately. And this is the reason why they get accused for playing God. Yeah. So, and I also I, think well, with our meteorologists, the information is sometimes just kept to the academics and not very accessible to the to rest of people. Of, like, you know, mm -hmm. like you look at the weather um, here in the United States. When a storm approaches, everybody knows Even, about it. I have it on my aware. phone. Right. Right. Everybody yeah. knows what the weather's going to be yeah. like. Yeah. And when you, and, and with us, it's hardly a job. Um, and this is why the reason television. why, I mean, if this was happening back in Africa, yeah. the incident we had in Niger would never have happened where they had a 122 degrees That's heat true. wave That's and true. a lot of people died. That's well, right. climate change, I think, affects countries disproportionately. The poor countries will suffer more than the richer countries. And in the richer countries, they're already thinking about how climate change will affect their future. The leading scientists already say, 
saying that the Earth's temperature will rise by about two degrees Celsius by 2050. That is within our lifetimes. And right. Western companies are already thinking of what they can do um, to help uh, future generations. Monsanto, for example, they are a controversial biotechnology company. They're already thinking of new ways to grow food, new places to grow foods. And then, of course, you guys have heard of genetically modified yeah, foods. Right. Um, so if we're yeah. not having this conversation, if we're not thinking yeah. about what's going to happen in 2050, we might be left behind. The sad part about it is that, I mean, when you look at it, uh, when I, and I want to emphasize this point, is that Africa and African countries are not emitting fossil fuel in the air. That, They're yeah. not the yes. ones that are creating the problem. It is the Eastern world and the Western world that are emitting all these fossil fuel in, in the environment. And But, you know, you find... That's Africa absolutely true. And actually, if you look at Mozambique, their carbon dioxide emissions are at 0.3% metric e tons compared to China, 2.2%. In India, 1.7%. Exactly. In East Africa, all those countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, they emit, their levels of emission is almost in existence. They're almost zero. And the World Bank says United States, China, Japan, and Russia, and India are the ones that are emitting all these fossil fuels. So we're realizing that Africa is taking the brunt of this um, pollution. And so it, it's pretty sad. And so people in Africa really have to really realize that um, even though, as you have asked earlier, the question, are we having the discussion that we are having? I think on the continent we are, just not as much because we don't believe the, the problem comes from us. Right. And one person who said it very well, uh, Mandela, this is a quote from Mandela, once he said, one cannot prepare for something while secretly believing that it will not happen. So well, I think that yeah. African countries don't believe it will happen because they're not creating the problem. Well, I think this is where, we, where our conversation should be because yeah. we're on the other side of the conversation, right? Africa, like you said, we... The problem is caused elsewhere. We're feeling the, the effects. But for us, it is the conversation is about the consequences right. of climate change. Uh, you know, so-called developed countries, they have built their economies right. by emitting greenhouse gases. Yeah. Right. And I think for, for us, uh, now we're hearing the warnings that the future and the, the climate change and the effects mm. in the future. But for yeah. many parts of Africa, the future is already here. That's we right. are feeling That's exactly the effects. Right. And yeah. I think what we can do is really not repeat the same climate mistakes of North America, of Europe, That's and parts, and parts of Asia. Learn from Africa, we've done a lot of things right. Um, with right. solar power, we've el eliminated plastic bags. I mean, yeah, they can yeah. take a couple of cues from us. Right, That's and exactly I, right. I really think that we have the opportunity here. Africa can expand its infrastructure and we can build out our, con our continent in a way that doesn't hurt the planet, that doesn't hurt our continent and doesn't hurt our people. And we try to do that. We try to do that when we when we change from using car um, charcoal to going through um, waste, uh, waste charcoal. Sometimes right. we see a lot of these companies, young people are actually starting these companies to to try to um, to eradicate and to do away with using car, um, charcoal as a way of cooking but I think the most important thing is for the mindset to change right what do you think Africa can do to curb the effects of climate change you'll find us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram we're also on whatsapp so reach out to us and add your voice to the conversation it's time for a break. When we come back, a look at women in Mozambique and what they're doing to cope with the cyclone Idai. Here's a glimpse of what some have been experiencing. People like my mother-in-law suffered a lot in Vuzi. She is now here with us, left with nothing. As relatives, we feel the pain. We cannot figure out how to give her a hand. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. You're watching Our Voices. Welcome back. It's often said women hold up half the sky. While in Africa, women also hold together households, communities, and economies. And when disaster strikes, including climate shocks, women have a special role to play. VOA's Amancio Miguel visited the Mozambican town of Beira to see how women were affected and how they're taking action after the storm. On March 14, like all the people in this community in central Mozambique, Julia Tom did not sleep. Winds and heavy rains whipped the area. 
She is in her 90s, weak and partially blind. Like many others, Tom sought refuge at a local high school. She still can't believe she managed to swim to higher ground holding onto her grandchildren, bruised from her battle to survive. The women here know that when disaster devastates and destroys, they must rebuild and restore. In Ingao, in the outskirts of Beira, Fatima Jesubasopa cares for those in her community who are destitute and alone, including the elderly. They are having hard times. It's too much. They don't have children or grandchildren. It's such a pain. They don't get enough food, no shelter. It's a big mess. In this camp, Anna Pirish, who saw her house collapse, cooks for other displaced people. She dreams of better days ahead. It's so sad. I thank God. God will deliver. We will recover in the future. I foresee myself rebuilding. I will. God will give me the strength. Those seriously affected by the cyclone are in displacement camps but some stayed behind. Since I have many kids, I found it hard to go there. 32-year-old Aida Juan has nine children to feed, so it's back to business, selling smoked fish in a beira market. But she's not earning enough. These days, there is no money. The cyclone took all the money. People don't have enough to buy food. They don't get enough to eat. Aida João, Julia Tomo, Ana Pires and Julia Basopa are some of the many women fending for their families and communities after the storm. But they're not giving up. Too many people rely on them. Karina Chodori and Amans Miguel, VOA, Beira, Mozambique. You know, Amancio's reporting there just really makes me think about how important preparedness is. Again, we talk about disaster preparedness. You can have as many um, hospital beds, ambulances, fire trucks and helicopters um, as, as you possibly need, but social preparedness is just as important and women can play such an important role when it comes to that. Yeah, and women are natural forward thinkers. I mean, if you think about it, our bodies are designed to always think of what's coming up next. Yeah, I agree. Forward thinking for sure. And I think we need some forward thinking on the part of our leaders too and really thinking about who are we training, um, are we equipping women, are we training women in advance so that they are able to respond to disasters. You know, often they are the first responders when something goes wrong, when disaster strikes, the women are there first. We just saw that in the story and we need to make sure that the distribution of information and that the materials, emergency materials are actually in their hands. Women in many African countries are already organized on the ground. I mean, yes. there's such an amazing resource. All we need to do is get to them the equipment that they need, the information yes. that they need. And, and also, yes. women have a very um, close connection to children. Mm -hmm. So if we protect, if we equip and prepare women, we're doing such a big favor for our children as you well. You made a really important you, you point about policy that I just want to get to really right. quick. Uh, we have to think about the policy with climate change. If we don't mm -hmm. change the laws to make sure that we're protecting our environment, we're not really making any and progress. And also education. You said something about edu education. Education is so key. I know women who's a trailblazer in her field, electrical engineer. She's originally from DRC, and she, she's amazing. She's a teacher, a professor at the University of Toledo here in Ohio, in the U.S., and she's also a researcher. I had a chance to talk with her when she was here in Washington a few days ago, and um, we chatted about her invention that she's been able to do. She, she actually um, did an equalizer to make batteries perform better and, and longer. Wow, she um, cool. She, you know, electrical vehicles and many other um, inventions that she did. Sandrine Mubenga, while in Washington a few days ago, I chatted with her on her inventions uh, of an equalizer to help batteries last longer and perform better, and many other inventions that she has made uh, in the past. I, I asked her what could be done to restore power quickly and efficiently after a cyclone like you die in Mozambique. And, you know, let's play a clip of one of her suggestions. Based on what happened in Puerto Rico, for instance, when uh, a hurricane destroyed the infrastructure, and even in Haiti, 
people turned to solar power. They built mini grids because it builds re resiliency to your uh, grid. Now, when you do mi mini grids and micro grid, what you are doing is you are building smaller grids for an area. And, and on top of that, you use solar power, which is not re relied, um, which is not depending on fossil fuel. Then you have a clean system for a community. This is, um, you know, one of the things she sees that could be done, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it makes sense. Uh, solo panels. Tapping women's so, ideas. I think it's really important to involve women, you know, because we know women are natural, nurturers, you know, they, I mean, they are the foref at the forefront when disasters strike. Um, just like the clip we watched earlier, we could see how women were involved in, like, fetching the water, making sure that mm. the, um, the toilets are clean, making sure that they were teaching the kids. So it's really important to that, make sure that these women are fully equipped. I'm just glad that um, organizations like CARE, like UNICEF, were, you know, be, were able to step up to the plate and help victims, particularly women, to you know, uh, rebuild all over again. And let's not forget the very, very local grassroots women's organizations who are always just at the ready to help always out ready. and help turn things around. These always women ready. are vital in rebuilding our communities. And, and you know, usually we don't even get to see what they're doing. And I'm glad that we were able, we were to, able see to see some of what they're doing. Well, there's a woman that I think the three of you will really like. She is from Eswatini, and her name is Elena Wamukoya. She is the bishop of the diocese of the kingdom formerly known as Swaziland. She's the first female bishop in the 12th Anglican provinces in Africa. Here's what she had to say about how climate change uniquely impacts women. Issues of climate change, they affect women and girls first and foremost. We are the people who are affected when there is drought. We are the people who are affected when there is no food because we are the people who see our children first thing in the morning when they wake up. And when they wake up and there is no food and you don't know where the next meal for your children will come from, you are the most affected. Well, obviously, there's a lot to say about this. And after the break, we meet a woman using her influence in the church to talk about climate change. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Here on Our Voices, we highlight the accomplishments of Africa's women in a segment we like to call Women to Watch. This is South Africa's weather maven, Muthoni Masinde. She is a computer scientist and a meteorologist, and she's come up with this nifty gadget, a drought predictor. Masinde says she uses science, cell phones, and indigenous knowledge to predict when farmers in South Africa, Kenya, and Mozambique can expect rain and drought. Well, I spoke to her during her recent visit to Washington. If science is about using knowledge to solve problems, Mutoni Masinde believes she has hit the motherload, using what she learned at school in the big cities of Africa and Europe, and from her mother on a small farm in Kenya. Growing up in the village, working in the small farm with my mother, I realized that she always depended on observable indicators to determine when she's going to start to plant, even what to plant. Across Africa, small-scale farmers rely on nature, trees and animals to predict rain and drought. I'll give you a very typical example. They look at dragonfly. If the dragonfly is flying three feet from the ground, they know it will rain in three weeks. But the problem is, with climate change, some of those animals, the insects, the trees that they use are disappearing. So we need them to bring something that can uh, bridge that gap, so the science. Masinde designed a tool to help farmers cope with the changes, a drought predictor. It's an early warning system that fuses modern science and ancient wisdom. Wireless sensors placed on farms measure temperature, rainfall and humidity. 
Those measurements are sent to farmers who are equipped with mobile phones and tablets so they can receive and send information in their mother tongue. Whenever they see the dragonfly or they see the flowering tree or they see the animals coming home jumping, they take a picture, they document and they send it to us. So as we receive on one hand indigenous knowledge, we also receive the science, so to say, the, the, the measurement. Then our models combine those two and come up with a prediction. It's part of Masinde's Itiki project, which works with farmers in Mozambique, South Africa and Kenya. Masinde hopes to expand her Itiki project across Africa to help more small farmers adapt to a changing climate. That discussion needs to be brought as quickly as possible to make them aware that sometimes this is, they, they always assume it's a curse, you know, this year didn't rain, it's a curse, but you need to make them wake up and actually realize this is climate change. How amazing is this woman? I was just so I just love that she uses yeah. indigenous, indigenous knowledge yeah. to predict Absolutely. the weather. We need more Mothonis on the African continent. That's I just so think funny. it's amazing how you can actually sense the weather, the environment, the animals, the, the, everything just put together. And it's the, amazing. It's almost like she just did it because she knew she had an education, but she mm -hmm. also remembered how her mother was so dependent on nature and on the weather when Absolutely. her mother was a small scale farmer. That's what very our ancestors used to do back in the day. Yeah, right. That's exactly you know, right. So, I mean, you know, and we heard this with the, the recent roots. cyclone. They said that the dogs started to disappear because they went to the yeah. mountains to avoid right, the cyclone. Right. So. And that, that, that they actually take this kind of knowledge seriously. Look. And that's amazing for passing on the culture and the knowledge that, that we have. We lost all of that, Hades. Yeah. I know. So we need to go back. Yeah. Yeah. Momotones, like you said. Yeah, Momotones. <laughs> if you know a woman worth watching, tell us about her on social media or tag us using the hashtag VOA Our Voices. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, find us at voanews.com. That's also where you'll find the latest news from around the world. We leave you with a quote from Nobel Peace Prize winner Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. Known for his work as an anti-apartheid and human rights activist, he also speaks out on climate change. He used his voice to say, There is a word used in South Africa that describes human relationships, Ubuntu. It says, I am because you are. We are made for each other, part of one family, the human family with one shared earth. And one thing we've learned in South Africa, when the arch speaks, we listen. <laughs> and that is our show this week from all of us here on Our Voices. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, goodbye.